All right, well, good morning. Why don't you go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 10, verse 13 to 16. We only have four verses this morning. And last week we talked about marriage. This week we're going to talk about the children, the family. Specifically, we're going to talk about is Christ's vision for the, church, for, for the children. Uh, and two simple points in this message as we go along. Uh, one, we need to bring our children and the kids in our church to Jesus. And secondly, we need to become like children if we are going to be in this kingdom. And so why don't we go ahead and read chapter 10, verse 13. It says this, And they were bringing the children to him so that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms, began blessing them, laying his hands on them. So the first point for Jesus' vision for the children of our church and even the world, and uh, we'll show you that argument in a second. Point number one is desire that your kids follow Jesus. And not only just your kids, but all the kids that step through these doors of the church. That it is God's desire for them to come to him. And we need to pray for them. We need to uh, bring them to them. It is a Jewish custom, just to give you a little background of this, it was a Jewish custom to bring children to be blessed by the elders, the rabbis, the synagogues, the temple. And many Old Testament examples, Noah, Isaac, uh, Isaac and Jacob, you can use, especially Jacob, you saw him blessing all of his children. There was, uh, as they, they, blessing was a big deal in the Old Testament. And simply you see parents coming to Jesus, desiring that they follow him. They're wanting, they, they saw all the miracles that he did. They saw all the amazing teachings and they saw that he was obviously from God. And they said, hey, we want our children to follow God. We want our children to follow this Jesus. It's not, Jesus is not just for adults, uh, for teenagers, for older people. He's for the kids. And in this chapter, we'll see there's a, the Luke uses a different word than Matthew and Mark because this story is found in all three of the synoptic gospels. But the one is for children, which is a general term for kids. And the other one is babies. And you see that in Luke 18. And so we're talking anywhere from babies to maybe around 12 years old. They were considered, 12 and 13, they were considered adults at that age already in in ancient Jewish society. But in the Western culture today, I think we could all agree upon this, that children are important. They, they, they're, they're cute, they, we, we, we respect them. I mean, we, they, Western society in general is, is bent towards kids, uh, but that is not the case in ancient Jewish society. They were actually uh, considered useless, powerless, uh, both socially and physically. Um, they, many of them didn't even make it to age 12. Uh, many of the children did not make it. I mean, they're... When you, when you have a child that is born healthy, you don't realize how much of a miracle that actually is. And that did not happen much in the ancient world. And even, uh, they say that even one out of four kids is a, is a, is a miscarriage, uh, statistically speaking. There's poor Gentile families, often discarded babies uh, if they thought that they could not support them. In fact, uh, in Egypt, it was June 17th in 1 BC, this is, a papyrus, uh, you know, they used to write on papyrus uh, plants in, in a scroll, and this is what they found. Uh, they found a, a letter uh, from a husband to an expectant wife. This is what it said. This is what he said to her. If it was a male, let it live. If it's a female, just cast it out. And so kids were not thought of very highly in the ancient world um, and as opposed to today. Um, but the disciples... Uh, as you see here in verse 13, as parents, moms and dads, uh, they actually give the, the male pronoun in this as you're, as you're looking uh, at the original. This is both moms and dads bringing their children to Jesus so that he might touch them and bless them. But the disciples rebuked him. Why do you think the disciples rebuked 
the parents. Why do you think that happened? What was in the minds of the disciples at that time as they were moving quickly throughout from city to city? They were gaining popularity, gaining momentum. And the disciples obviously still didn't get it. I mean, we've just spent 10 chapters realizing that the, the disciples still did not understand why Jesus came. Jesus came for one primary purpose is to die for man's sin so that they might be forgiven and live with him forever and prove that by the resurrection. But disciples have little political power. They, they, they didn't mean much. When they, when they saw Jesus blessing the children, when they saw the parents coming and blessing, they, 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 it, was, it was infringing upon their plan to, to become more popular, to, to again, that idea of overthrowing Rome. And there's no way kids are gonna be a part of Jesus's plan. This is kind of a waste of time. Why are you holding babies, Jesus? Well, we have, we have work. <laughs> we, have, we, we have real big boy work to do here. Like, don't you remember what we're, what we're doing here? And Jesus is saying, no, you don't understand. He was actually indignant. That is such a strong word. Furious, angry, irate, outraged, agitated at their rebuke because of the injustice to children. And Jesus knew that. So the point number two is that we need to fight for our kids to follow Jesus. It's not just a desire. It cannot stop with a desire. We know where that leads to. Desire doesn't go anywhere unless it's disciplined. We'll never get to a place of delight of watching our kids follow the Lord without the discipline, without the fight to bring them to Jesus. And yes, that is a daily fight. How many of you know that as parents? It's a daily fight for them to follow Jesus. Do we force it? No. I mean, do we, we save our kids? No. We cannot save our kids. But we need to fight that they would find, find Jesus and follow him. That, that word rebuke that the disciples used was the same word to rebuke demons. It was the same word to rebuke the storm which the enemy was behind. It was the same word that was used when, when Peter denied Jesus and, and Jesus rebuked him for becoming like Satan in that moment. These are strong words. The disciples who followed Jesus, who watched Jesus move about the earth to, to, to see the kindness of the Lord, to see how he moved on the earth to heal the brokenhearted, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, people who are oppressed spiritually, who had no hope. And they had the nerve to use that same, like that, to rebuke Jesus. What are you doing? thinking of touching children, even wasting any time with them. They're useless to our society. You know that. You grew up with this. You were a kid. You know this. They don't mean anything. They don't do anything but disobey their parents. And Jesus is saying, you've got it all wrong. He was indignant he said, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He loves kids. He actually has a vision for our children's ministry beyond babysitting. He actually cares that they would know him. He actually cares that there would be people that would give their life to children in the church. Maybe that is, you know, for a moment you're working with children's ministry, like on a rotation, once a month deal or whatever, and we want you to do that. But it's, it's a lifetime. No matter what age you are, you could care for the children in this house. You are never too old to, to stoop down, to humble yourself, and to speak gibberish to a baby, right? Right? You're, you're, you're never too old to get down, right, and just run around, you know, the church chasing one of those little ones. Of course, with the parents' permission. <laughs> he cares about kids. Like he's into it. Like he loves children. He was mad. He was like the other people say, P.O.'d at the disciples because of what they did. 
I mean, he was, I mean, indignant is a very strong word. And I don't want you to miss that. The original language is, sometimes you can't really, until you, until you look at it and look at what does indignant mean? I mean, he's outraged. He's like, what are you doing? These are my children. Like I care about them. Do not hinder them in this church from knowing who I am. Do not hinder them from this church of, of let them knowing that they are absolutely 100% a part of this church. Like they are members before you are. And I'll show you why in a moment here. But they are members of this church. They are members of the universal church. They are saved. If they die before the age of accountability, they go directly to heaven. But if you die as an adult, you don't go directly to heaven. If you reject Christ, you go to hell forever. But for the kids, for babies, if you ever lost a baby, if you ever had a miscarriage, you'll see that baby in heaven. He won't be a baby anymore. He'll be an adult. Can you imagine what that reunion is going to be like? Can you imagine if, if you had, you know, if you've repented from, from an abortion, there's forgiveness for that. And you will see that, not baby, but adult. Yeah, of course, you'll, you'll never be able to raise that child because they're God's child. They're his child. And they'll be a full grown adult However, heaven works at that point. I mean, we, we're limited in some capacity. But they'll be in heaven. Aborted babies, miscarried babies, babies who die tragically, little kids who die at the age of accountability. And some say, what is the age of accountability? You know, some scholars say 12, 13 is really when you become an adult. At that, when you really understand that you're a sinner and you've sinned against mom and dad, you've sinned against God. And I want to go through some passages here to kind of help make some sense of that a little bit more. We need to fight for our kids because they belong to the kingdom. Permit the children to come to me. Allow them to come. Do not hinder them, Peter, James, and John, for your agenda, for your purposes. This isn't an adult church. This is a family church. This is, a fam this is an all-included family church, and they belong to me for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these, these kids, they, these babies, they belong. And I, I love them. They're my fathers. He made them. It reveals the compassion for the helpless, the vulnerable, the powerless. This is, this is I mean, you can see the character of Jesus. And this is the point of why we're going through the gospel of Mark, because I want you to see who Jesus truly is. He loves kids as opposed to this world who hates them. Jesus backed the parents. I love that. And they included, like I said, included dads. Moms and dads were there bringing their kids to Jesus. What an incredible, just pause for a second. Just take that in. You know, sometimes, you know, that's, it's kind of poked at, like in churches, like kind of made fun of, like, oh, you know, look at Jesus with the little kids or something. I mean, that's, a, that's an actual, actually a beautiful picture. Because he's going to make, he's going to use this as an illustration where we're going to land on today, which is so important for everyone else here. So we're going to talk about the kids first, and then we're going to talk about you. We're going to talk about the kids first. Kids are so important to him. I'm, I'm going to keep stressing that. Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them. We should do whatever it takes in this church Money, training, developing of people. We should do whatever it takes to bring our kids to Jesus. Training our parents, having, we just had one, I think last February, March. We just had a marriage and parenting class. We're gonna do them again. I mean, Nicole and I, we teach our marriage classes at least two, two times a year, at least with our new engaged couples. There's a little family element, but that's the basis of it. You can't have babies without parents at least rightfully, a healthy family, the way God's designed it. 
We talk a lot about marriage. And we want to talk a lot about raising our kids. So we're going to probably do another class at some point for our kids, for our parenting, parents to raise their kids right. Because we need to desire, not only desire that our kids follow Jesus, but we need to fight for them. We need to not hinder them. And we can provoke our kids. We can exasperate them. And, and, and as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, and, and hinder them from knowing Christ by our actions, by the way we treat them. If our kids, do you, do you want our kids to go home thinking, I'm not loved at this place. Nobody really cares about me here. I'm, not, I'm obviously not valued. What would it take to show them that they're valued here? You know, during the pandemic, a lot of people um, thought Grace Community Church, that's where I go to school, Master's Seminary in Los Angeles. And it's a phenomenal church. But they have, they have like seven, 8,000 people, but it's in, it's in right in the heart of LA. And uh, I've, I've spent at least five weeks now in the last couple of years there. And um, it is, it is a, it's truly a sight to see their campus and how they set up their campus. But the whole thing is designed for kids. I mean, I didn't realize, I mean, I'm looking around, I'm like, there are kids everywhere. They have like thousands of, hundreds of kids running all over the place. It's insane. And, and, I, and, I, and it dawned on me, I was like, I want to know a little bit behind what's going on over there. And I mean, they work hard to invest in their kids to make them know that they are a part of that church. And during the pandemic, you know, it got really goofy out in California. We didn't even see nearly as much craziness as they saw on, on the West Coast. And so they, they, you know, had all these lockdowns and laws and stuff. I mean, I got yelled. I got a ticket in California for not wearing a mask outside. I'm like, where the heck am I right now? What, I need to show my passport? I mean, this is crazy. So it was, it was just absolutely insane. And so you go on campus, it's like a little, it's like a little world, like within a, within a world. I mean, it's, it's like a little bubble, that place. And when they, the, the government wanted them to lock down, uh, everything. I mean, they, they w- sh- shouldn't have met and they, they had, s- people would put flyers on the car saying, you're killing our community, you're killing our people. No, they're saving their community. They're not killing their community. Depends on what narrative you want to listen to. They love their kids so much that they wanted their kids to be at church to hear the word of God. That's love. It's almost like the vision was like, hey, All right, is it about the parent? I mean, they can can watch it on YouTube. But they understood. We got to have the kids come here. They need to know early on that they are a part of this kingdom. They are a part. If they were to die today, they would go directly in the arms of God into heaven. They are a part of this kingdom. They are part of the church. And I think the first day they allowed, like they they had the kids come back, because they got in so much trouble for this. They had a thousand kids running around. They had balloons, they had candy, they had donuts. I mean, the place was like a zoo, like a circus. I'm like, what is this place? But they proved that kids mattered at that church. They matter. And that's that's who we want to be. That's the vision of, of Christ for the church. They should be running around full of joy, full of happiness, full of wonder. And, and, and parents, and not only parents, but also the you know, college students and families and young adults coming up to them. Hey, what's your name? How are you doing? What's going on in your life? And just high-fiving them, chasing them around, getting them a donut. Of course, parents' permission. You know, <laughs> so I'm going to get a lot of trouble for all this. You just... <laughs> they are the church. I mean, of course, it goes without saying, sign up for children's ministry. You know, just sign up. Be a part of that. Be a part of this ministry. I mean, we, we would not miss those early years. I mean, our kids for the first, I don't know, 10 years of the, uh, at least seven, eight years of the church, we uh, were a part of children's ministry. And I mean, even before even this church, Nicole and I were, that's all we did. We served in children's ministry. We loved it. We babysat throughout college. We love kids. Just, of course, it keeps you young. You know, just, you're always up with the latest stuff with whatever they're going through and um, just be a kid. You could be a kid and like legally be a kid when you're around them. You can just act stupid and they love it. <laughs> it's great. It's, it's awesome. You should try it. 
Um, but it's a lot, of, I mean, when we have background checks and all that stuff, I mean, we're, you know, up to date with all that and, and you can't just, you can't just have anybody. And that, that goes with, that's what we're trying to say. We don't want anybody just around our kids. We want to make sure we have the right people there. The people that are safe. And the people that, because I, I mean, we, we, and we did that. We, I think it works out, you know, just when you plant the church, you, just, you have your kids, you care for your kids, you want to see them grow up and, and, and graduate from children's ministry. And then the next generation, we got we to gotta go back in and get in the game. So many of you have kids, and it matters that they are loved in this church, not just by you, but by everybody else around you, right? Amen? You know, one of the greatest blessings a parent can give their children is to evangelize them. You are the primary missionaries in their life. I mean, it, you can, you, and one thing we, can, we are not going to do here at the church is, is what, whether it's children's ministry or youth or even college, I guess, at that, at, at that point, but is to blame the church because their kid's not following God. No, it's your, it's your problem as parents. You have to get in their world. You're with them all day, every day. The, children, the, the church is, it, we, we co-labor with you. We come alongside you and we say, all right, we're gonna do this together and we wanna support. The main role for children's ministry, the main role for youth ministry, and I was in youth ministry for years too and, and children's, is that we gotta care for our parents. We wanna help them serve, we wanna help serve the parents so that they can be the hero in the home. They can be the coach. They can be the parent in the home and have the tools that they need with the scriptures in order to raise their kids up to know God. And it's never too early to teach them truths. If you want to get a good, I'm just going to give you a little practicals on some of this stuff. But if you want to get a, get a good child, a children's Bible, um, the Jesus Storybook Bible is fantastic. It's amazing. I just, I like reading it. Like, I mean, I would read it to my kids and I'm like, man, this stuff is good. Maybe I should like pre- use this to preach out of. Like, this is really good stuff. Like how he'd, how he'd take the Old Testament and point to Christ. It's just brilliant how they do that. Sinclair Ferguson has four Different, um, different books right now. I think it's like what did, who Jesus is, what did Jesus do, how Jesus cares, how Jesus loves. You can get that book. Simple, I think that goes from like maybe like four to eight or something uh, around that age or 10 maybe. And then from there, uh, we have other material online for you as well. You can always reach out and ask. But we always, we wanna be a resource. We constantly wanna resource our parents. And, and you guys, a lot of our elders, uh, you know, they're getting the, the newest and latest, you know, children's books and they're always coming out with something new and better and pop-up stuff and, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. So it's a lot, it's a lot of fun. But, but, it, but invest in your kids, desire that they follow Jesus and you gotta fight. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna elaborate a little bit more on the fight because there's just so much to say about this and why Jesus had such a stern rebuke to the disciples and how they hindered the children from coming to Christ. Listen to what J.C. Ryle says. It is the duty of every congregation to make provision for the spiritual training of its children. No no church can be regarded as being in a healthy state which neglects its younger members and lazily excuses itself on the plea, oh, that young people will be young. They're They're just kids. And that is useless to try to do them any good. Such a church shows plainly that it has not the mind of Christ. The great head of the church, which is Jesus, found time to take special notice of children. Although his time on earth was precious, we can all agree upon that, he only had three and a half years. He did not think little boys and girls of small importance. He had room in his mighty heart even for them. And the same is true for us. Let me ask you, young adults, where you're you're just career bent, do you have time on a Sunday afternoon to just take a moment and ask how our parents are doing, how the little baby's doing, how the little child's doing? Just ask, how are you guys doing? Can I get you anything? Can I serve you? Can I love on you? What, what could you do to just ask them questions? What are you learning in school? That means so much. Can you imagine? I mean, I look for that in our elders. If I, if I see an elder that does not really care for kids, he's done. Because Jesus cared so much about the kids. Our leaders must do that. They must. I, I, knew, a, I knew a professor that would, <laughs> during his hiring, 
kind of learned from that over the years, but a professor that would, would watch when he was a pastor, he'd, when he was training elders, he would watch his elders, the future elders of the church, he'd watch how they interact with the kids. If he didn't interact with the kids, well, he didn't get picked. Because this stuff matters. Cares about the kids, and so do we. For the kingdom of God belongs to these. There's no conditions, caveats for children. Uh, like I said, before the age of accountability, I want to be clear. I just want to be clear on this. Before the age of accountability, um, children go directly to heaven. In Ezekiel 16, 21, even the pagan children belong to God. All children in the world belong to God. This is so important for missions as we go overseas. And you're like, wait, these guys, man, they, they, their parents are, you know, practicing another religion or whatever. We got to care for these kids because they too are a part of the kingdom. Now, if they reach the age of accountability, the 13, 14, 15, well, then we need to treat them as adults. We need to share the gospel with them. And that's important, but it even trains us how we even think when we go overseas. It just, it, it helps us to see that, hey, those kids right there, when we went to Colombia or Japan and they were into Shintoism or whether we went to, we're going to Rome and there's a lot of Catholicism there or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever, wherever we go, there's going to be kids there that we're going to be able to minister. And I even talked to uh, uh, the, the pastor in Italy even so that we're, they're going to try to, to put on these kids camps and so we could uh, share Jesus with them and, and then reach their parents that way. And so come prepared even to work with kids as you go to Italy. They're important. But I do want to just say a few things uh, just to our parents I think would be uh, that I think would be really helpful here, just some practical stuff. Number one is we need, to, we need to repent for letting the culture raise our kids. You need to repent. If you're an older adult and you've let your kids kind of go through the system and you didn't really try or do anything about that, I think the first thing you gotta do, and this is not a guilt trip, this is not a condemnation, it's just, just have an opportunity to repent. I don't have time to kind of go into all the nuances of that, but I just want to say, first and foremost, we need to repent for allowing the culture to raise our kids. And not only that, but even when they're young, even now, to just kind of let the, whether let uh, uh, media indoctrinate them, like giving them just devices and letting them just go to town on those things. I even read somewhere where like, what is it, the, I, the, the Steve Jobs, a lot of those executives for Apple, they wouldn't even give their kids iPads that you read. If these people don't even give their kids iPads, why in the world are they selling it to kids? Something not right with that. Not only that, but we need to repent for neglecting our kids. And then for us as Christian parents, we need to repent for the fear of man, of always being afraid what people think, being afraid of being called extreme or bigots. Get used to it. Just get used to it. Wear that as a badge of honor. I mean, I've been called that. The last two or three years, I've been called all those things. Extreme, controlling, bigot, racist, whatever. You know, I think at one point you gotta say, if a fool calls you a name, does it really matter what it is? I mean, I, I think about it. I mean, does it, does it like, it just, it's like, okay, you're a fool. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't stick. It's not like somebody I respect. It's not somebody I'm looking up to. It's not somebody giving me constructive feedback. No, it's a fool who has his head in the sand. They don't matter. And we need to, we need to be okay with calling because these are our kids. Whether you're even having a, a battle with grandparents, watch that. That's a huge battle of how this is how we raised you. This is how you're going to raise them. And there could be a, 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 you know, a budding of heads. You could be called even by your own family members. What do you think you're doing with these kids? You're going to hurt them. You're going to shelter them. You're going to brainwash them. We need wisdom to fight against the secular culture. We need wisdom 
against their perversions, their lies. I mean, as of now, the LGBTQ, whatever other thing, is promoting sex books at three years old in schools. I, mean, I, I literally, I just try to think, you know, sometimes it's like you could, you could be all into this stuff because you, you think this is woke, it's cool, it's whatever. But just when you have a kid, just think, this, okay, just you have a little kid, he's playing with airplanes and just playing in the sand and just hanging out. Dad, you know, I want some ice cream and it's okay, all right? So, and then you're like, you're like sending him the next day and they're learning about how to have sex. That's whacked. I mean, there's no other word for that. And then when they get a little older, it's like, hey, you know, you could, little Judah, you know, it's like, you could be a girl. I mean, stop playing with airplanes. I'll give you a doll. You could have fun with that. You know, it's no wonder that Jesus said this. That if you cause a little one to stumble, it is better off that you, you are dead. And you want to be a principal of a school? You want to be a teacher at a school? And if you are, don't you dare compromise. Because you are in line with that passage. You're better off dead than causing a little one to stumble. You might be thinking, whoa, hey, it's money. Yeah. You could die with all the money <laughs> into hell. We're going to read about that next week in The Rich Young Ruler. Don't play with fire. The devil's fire. I would not do that. Public schools are a dangerous place to send your kids. Now, I would never say that 10 years ago when we first started the church plant. But I would say that now, even with DeSantis in, even with all the great stuff that he's doing, just you, we need to pray for our kids. As they go to, when they're going to school, we need to pray for them. And we, we need to basically deprogram them when they come home if you're choosing public school. So if they go to school for, let's just say, eight or nine hours, whatever it is, I don't know. How, you know from, when you come home, you're not cutting the grass. You're not, you're, you're, you're not just going shopping. You're not, you're, you're not doing, you are going to sit with your child and you're going to deprogram them from everything that they just learned. Now it's a 16-hour day. They learn, they relearn. I mean, that, but that's a choice though. I mean, and it's, it's, we're, it's not a forced deal, but that's a choice that everyone has to make. But that is exactly what you need to be doing because you do not want to hinder your children from knowing the Lord. That's what Jesus is saying. You do not want to hinder, do not hinder the little ones from knowing me. And when we do that as parents, when we, are, when we do not give them Jesus, that hurts his heart and there are major consequences for that. We need to protect them. Jesus took the children to himself. Can you imagine that? I mean, Jesus is taking the children to himself and he's saying, let them come to me. I'm not, I do not want to give them to the secular culture. The disciples are like, hey, look, man, we got, a, we got a program here. If you just listen to me, Jesus, we'll be popular. We'll, we'll get Rome. We'll overthrow Rome. This will be wonderful. And Jesus is saying, you missed it. These are my children, and I'm not interested in giving them to the secular culture. I'm, he didn't say it to the little boy coming up to him saying, hey, little one, you can be all that you want to be. If you want to be a girl, wonderful, man, I'm for that. Go ahead, and, and there you go. Man, I'm, I'm for that. Is what they're indoctrinating people now in is saying that that's a God-given right. It's not. It's not. This is what Luther said, and then I'll, I'll, I'll end with this little deal. Luther says this, I am much afraid that the universities will prove to be the gates of hell unless they diligently labor and explain the Holy Scripture and engrave them in the hearts of the youth. Now, people at that time, they went to, they went to college very young. They went to college at 14, 15, I mean, early, early on. I mean, most of them got their master's and were done with it by 18 but understand this, or Hitler understood this. I was talking about two Germans today, Hitler and Luther. But I want you to understand, okay, listen, many years later, this is what he said. And I want you to parallel this to today. He alone who owns the youth gains the future. He understood that. And that's exactly what's happening today. 
They understand if we preach feminism, women aren't going to be in the homes anymore. What's going to happen? The women are out and out in the homes or at work. Where are the kids? School. We'll just indoctrinate the heck out of them and make them ours. Don't be a fool and think otherwise. This is exactly what's happening. And Hitler understood that. You get the kids, you get the future. And Luther said, please, don't let these universities be handed over to Satan. And the only way that happens is if we neglect them. That's why we cannot neglect our universities like we said this morning, earlier today, at Pastor's Prayer Hour. And we cannot neglect our children. They matter to God. They matter to God. Amen? America's children are being taken out of the parents' hands and placed into the secular culture. Right into the agenda of the leftists. Point number three is believe that your, that your kids are in the kingdom. Jesus does not bless unbelievers. We know that because of those who reach the age of accountability, God will hold them accountable. We're not saying that children are sinful, are, are not, not sinful. They are. I could rattle off a bunch of scripture for that. I mean, Psalm 51, 5, I was brought forth in iniquity and in my sin, my mother conceived me. Psalm 58, 3, wicked are the estranged from the wound. They're estranged from the womb. They're sinful from the womb. They, go, they, they who speak lies go astray from what? From birth. Ephesians 2, 3, the children of wrath. Genesis 8, 21, intent of man's heart is evil from youth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then kids grow up to be sinful adults. There's no, 1 Kings 8, 40, or 46, there's no man who does not sin. Psalm 143, 2, in God's sight, no man lives righteous. On and on and on. Romans 3, very famous passage, known as righteous, not even one. So how in the world do these kids get to heaven? Same way adults do, by his grace. For whatever reason, I don't know how God, I mean, he, he, the only way for man to get to heaven is through Christ. And so by God's grace, God covers the children. They're his elect. If they die before the age of accountability, it goes directly to his arms. One said this, this I've, you know, there, there is, unfortunately, there is, a, there is kind of a debate in the theological world about kids potentially going to hell. I think that's atrocious thought. But this theologian says this against that notion. And R.A. Webb, he says this, if a dead infant were to be sent to hell on no other account than, than that of its original sin, there would be good reason for that judgment. Of course, there would be good, I mean, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, including children, because sin is reality. But listen to this, but the child's mind would be a perfect blank as to the reason of its suffering. Under such circumstances, it would know suffering, but it would have no understanding of the reason, reason for his suffering. It just wouldn't make sense. It's senseless suffering. So we know that through the scriptures, even Job 3 says this, Job wished that he was stillborn. And he, he, was, uh, he was born as an infant. So they would go what? Straight to heaven. It says that in Job 3, 11 to 17. You know, parents can have great comfort this morning. That if you lost a child, if you lost even a little one, even, even past infancy, 10, 11, you know, just tragic deaths. You hear it all the time. I just, I went to a funeral, actually, I think it was probably about six months ago, I went to one, it was a little, I think it was a little four, four or five-year-old. It's horrible just to watch the parents, but they had such, they were grieving, but had such hope that they one day would see that little girl in heaven. What a wonderful thing. And Jesus proves that by bringing the children to him and saying, the kingdom is theirs. And of course, the famous illustration of that is 2 Samuel 12, where David's son died after he had an adultery with Bathsheba through uh, David knew the consequences of that sin, even though he was forgiven. And then he fasted and prayed until the child died. And he said, this child will be with me in heaven. I will see him one day. But he could not be consoled when his other son, Absalom, died, a murderer. He could not be consoled. He could be consoled when his, the infant died because he knew one day there would be the hope of the resurrection and we'd, he'd see him. But he could not be consoled when his older son Absalom died because he knew that Absalom would be in hell for his sin because he never repented. And so we know that theologically it's helpful. And the last point is that we all must come as children to Christ 
to enter the kingdom. And this is really what the point of the message. I mean, if you just, the, the tip of the spear is right here. It says in verse 15, truly I say to you. So he uses all this as an illustration. Jesus was a master teacher and would, would, would use teaching moments to explain the kingdom. He says, truly I say to you. Anytime you say truly, it's an emphasis. He's saying, listen to this disciples and anyone else around. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, like this child that he had in his arm, and some say he had a, he had a baby in his arm. Uh, I got to this, even this, this week, got to hold uh, one of my nephews, a little baby, just slobber everywhere, just to hold him uh, in my arms like a little child. He shall not enter it at all. And this baby couldn't do anything. I mean, he could feed himself. He can crawl to the bathroom, hop up on the toilet seat and go to the bathroom. I mean, the illustration is pretty simple, isn't it? It's pretty clear. If you don't come helpless like this little child, if you don't recognize your need for salvation, if you don't recognize your need to be forgiven of sin, to come humble, just crawl up in, in the arms of Christ or him to even pick you up because you can't do it yourself. You'll never be saved. There is no salvation. The analogy is simple. It demonstrates that salvation is entirely by grace and by grace alone. And that's just simply just cry, crying out. I mean, it's just calling, calling out to the Lord, crying out to the Lord, just saying, Lord, I need you. But what happens is that if you die with your sins unforgiven, every single sin, everything that you've done, everything, think about this, everything that you've ever said, anything that you've ever done in this life is recorded in the book of the Lord. It would be so much, it would be such a mountain of evidence that it would be the silliest thing to stand before God one day and say, don't my good works outweigh the bad? You won't even stand a chance. You'll be melted on the floor knowing. You'll actually beg God to send you to hell because you know that it would be the right thing to do. But the only way to salvation is to call upon the name of the Lord. Now. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time of salvation. It's today. You may not have tomorrow. I, I literally, I got picked up from the airport from Chicago yesterday. And Jessica is telling us about another one who dies from a motorcycle accident. Young guy. He's like probably 20s. Senseless death. With that person has already been sentenced if he did not know God. And they will never get out of that horrific place called hell. When you hear stuff like that, you can't help but think, Lord, this stuff is real. And if you were to die today, what would Christ say to you? Would he say, depart from me, I never knew you? The workers of iniquity, you just practiced sin all your life. You knew that. Or would he say, as we all long to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've believed in me and you did exactly what I've called you to do. Come in and enter my joy for all of eternity. The gospel's clear. And the way in is clear. Just come as a child. It's to be just like a child and you know, before we, I want to end on this. Uh, we, our family loves to do surprises. I mean, we're like into that. I mean, we have like surprises. We, we just, I think I get more joy out of that uh, than, than, than anything else. But we decided to surprise our kids and go see grandparents. And uh, Nicole's got a little cabin up in, her parents got a little cabin up in Illinois, two hours south of Chicago. And it's middle of nowhere, no cell service. And we haven't seen them in a while. And uh, we just thought, hey, it'd be fun to take the kids. Airfare was cheap. We just went and uh, had our parent, or in-laws pick us, pick us up there at the airport. And so all, like, I think we did, we did this for like four weeks, which is 
not easy for me. If you know me and surprises, it just does not work. And I'm just like about to blurt something out and I have to kind of like cover it up. And, and it's like, how do I do this? You know, for four weeks straight. And the kids are coming up with all sorts of stuff. They're like, dad, I know we're going to Winter Park and we're going to eat out. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> it's like, yeah, just keep that expectation low. You know? <laughs> it's wonderful. It's like, we never eat out, right? And uh, so they think like the coolest thing is just like, hey, we're going to go ride the gondolas at Disney, the free stuff, you know. <laughs> they know their parents. But then you, got, then, you got, then, you got, then you got little Judah, and he's running around, and he's like, I got it. I know what it is. I, I know it. Parents have paid off the house, <laughs> and they're buying property in our backyard and building something and there's gonna be a landing strip for an airplane. It's gonna be perfect. And on top of that, they bought us Disney passes. That's it. It's exactly what it's gonna be. I'm like, how in the world are we gonna tell them that none of that is true? <laughs> like we are so far from any of those things to even be. But just the, the impossibility in that little boy's mind, somehow he thinks that could happen. That's what's gonna happen. It's gonna be awesome. I'm gonna believe for it. I'm gonna trust. It's going to materialize before my eyes. And it totally did not at all. So, but I love that. I love that he believes that anything can happen totally dependent on his parents. A little boy is not innocent by any means. A little boy is just as sinful as anybody I know. But he is the Lord's. He is the Lord's. Don't stop believing. That, I, honestly, that, that probably could not have been a more perfect time. The Lord definitely has a sense of humor. Do not stop believing. That was the song that was going off. That is awesome. That was the, that was the Chicago White Sox theme song when they were going in the World Series. That's just don't stop believing. Just keep going for it. But he is the Lord's, isn't he? I just love that childlike faith. And that's exactly how we come to him. We come to him like with that childlike faith that dad, he can do anything. He's capable of doing the impossible. Amen. That's how the Lord wants us to come to him. Not growing up with entitlement like the Pharisees. Not growing up with a level of entitlement like the disciples who come along and say, we don't need these guys. No, Jesus is saying, you guys don't have childlike faith. You guys got the whole, your whole lives planned out. You think you know everything that's going to happen in the world. You got it all planned out. You're controlling. You're entitled. You're not dependent. You're independent. But I like these little guys. And he brings them to himself as a great illustration. He's, 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 got his, he's got the baby in his hand. He's saying, truly, I'll tell you this. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like these guys. This dude's like spitting up all over Jesus. Just like they do now. He's like, these guys can't do anything together. They can't, they, they can't change the diaper. They can't feed. Unless they come like this, they simply will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Come like a child. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us this amazing, amazing illustration of becoming like children. But even, even more than that too, just the how you love kids, how they're a part of the kingdom, how you have all sorts of kids in this world that you've marked out for yourself. Lord, I pray that we can learn from you, that we become more like you, pay attention to the lowliest of low, those people that don't have any status in society and frankly being taken advantage in our society for their gain. Let us take the children back. Let's bring them to you. Let's desire that they follow you. Let's fight for them. Let's believe they're in the kingdom. And let's become like children, believing in the word of God, trusting in your word like kids, humble, teachable, moldable, that we become more like you. Let's be a loving church towards kids. Let's be a safe church 
God, I pray that you would protect us from all the enemy schemes and protect the children that are going to public school, even Christian school, private schools, charter schools, whatever. Lord, protect their little ears as we've always prayed for so long. Protect their ears, protect their eyes, protect their hearts. And I pray that we would not be a stumbling block for them, but that we would be a resource for them to point them back to you. Let's be a family church. Let's be a family church. It doesn't take much, but we think we see it here. That's Christ's vision, isn't it? To care for, from the cradle to the grave, we care for all people. We love them. So why don't we stand to our feet? And I, I just as a, you know, I don't always do this, but just as a pastoral word, I, I just, I do want to pray for parents. Um, parenting is the hardest thing. I know that. I recognize that. And many people feel like maybe they've totally bombed. I feel like I fail it every day, every single day. That's why I need the Lord every morning. I'm like, Lord, I feel like I've failed again and again and again. I just, I don't know how to do this thing. You need to teach me how to do this. I have no clue how to parent. I just, we, I, I need the Lord every day to help our kids know him. And so just as parents, whether you're young or old, you just, you need the grace of God. And just come to the cross. Say, Lord, I don't know how to do this, but I want to do it right. I want to fight for our kids. I want to bring them to Jesus. And I, I need your help to do that. It's not an easy thing. It's simple as far as what we read, simple vision of Jesus that's clear. The hard part now is doing the work. And I do want to just be sensitive to, to parents that uh, they just feel like maybe your kids are older and it's just, man, I don't know what to do with these people. I, I'm no longer, they're no longer young. I, don't, I mean, I feel like I failed, but there, there's hope that God could save them. There's hope that God can bring them back. That's why we're here, right? I mean, this is why we go to church. We want to hear the gospel. We want to hear that there's hope for, for, uh, for situations that are just far beyond uh, human repair. And so let's, let's believe for that. Amen? All right, so let's pray for our parents this morning. Just even, just, you know, you can do that out loud where you're at. Let's pray for our parents. And let's pray for our kids. Uh, and then let's, let's, uh, let's have a great week. Amen? All right, love you guys.